I'm uh, Steve Mildenhall, and today we're going to be talking about the role of motive in insurance pricing. Motive adds an interesting extra wrinkle to the pricing problem because it's not apparent from looking at the cash flows alone. The material I'm going to present is covered in a lot more detail in my book, Pricing Insurance Risk, written with uh, John Major, and all of the examples can be reproduced using my aggregate Python. There's going to be three themes that I want to emphasize. The first one is inequality. So an insurer writes a bunch of different contingent cash flow contracts, but I'd like to be able to treat them all in the same way. Often we will divide them into, well, this is an insurance contract or a reinsurance contract or a financing debt contract, and we treat them differently because of that. I'd like to just be able to treat all cash flows in the, in the same way without that overlay. Secondly, we'll see motivation matters. Is the cash flow something that is sought out by the customer, the person who buys it, or did the insurance company, for whatever reason, want to sell it to that customer? And that difference of sought versus sold is going to have an impact on pricing. And then thirdly, we'll see that spectral methods that we cover in a lot of detail in the book are a great way of reflecting motivation. I want to work with a very simple market setup. I'm always a big fan of, of walking before you can run. Uh, so we're going to have a one period insurance company. There's going to be three players in this market. We're going to have risks or insureds um, who are at time zero going to remit some premium to the insurance company. At the same time, capital markets and reinsurers are going to remit uh, amounts of collateral or capital to make up the assets that the insurance company requires uh, to make good on its uh, promises. And then at time t equals one, lost payments are going to be made back out to the insureds and any residual amount of money is going to be returned to the capital markets or to reinsurance. Now, if you've seen me uh, present on this topic before, there's usually a fourth box on this diagram, but here I want to simplify things a little bit by saying, uh, in, I'm going to consider the case where there's no default. So the insurance company will hold enough assets to make good on any possible loss outcome that it contracts uh, with the risks. Um, default turns out to be um, a, uh, an important but in irrelevant complication. And it's, it's often simpler to just take that off the page to start with um, and, and see how things work out. And that's what we'll do today. So I want to start by showing you some cash flows. And this is a bit of an anchoring exercise. I'd like you to take some time to look at these and think about the price uh, that you would want for each of these, just so you've got a number in your mind. It'll make the examples as we go uh, through um, more meaningful, I think, to you. So here are four potential cash flows that an insurance company can make at time t equals one. There's, there's uh, 10 scenarios here, and then the four risks, x1, x2, x3, x4. Um, what I want you to do is to think about, okay, if I had to make these payments at time t equals one, what premium would I want uh, from each of the risks at time t equals zero to do that? And I want you to be thinking that uh, the 10 scenarios represent all the possible outcomes. So this isn't a sample. This isn't loss experience in this little model world. These are the only 10 things that can happen. Um, these cash flows are the only business that this company is going to write. And I want you to ignore investment income, taxes, expenses, and so forth. We're just after a risk loaded pure premium. And you might also want to think about what each cash flow represents. Um, and you can uh, scan the QR code there or, or follow the link. Uh, I've got a little survey form if you would like to just input your, your thoughts on this. It will be great to, to gather some different views. And there's a, a place there where you can even uh, put some, some notes as to your thought process would be very helpful. So I, I would suggest you pause it here and just, just give this some, some thought for a couple of minutes. All right, so hopefully you've got some numbers in your mind now. Um, and I'm going to go through some discussion and some observations about these cash flows. Probably the most important thing to note is that the payments sum to 100 in every scenario. So if you wrote everything, if you wrote these four risks, there is in fact no net risk to you. Okay. And since we're ignoring investment income, you, you would argue from that, that the total premium, it certainly can't be less than 100 because you're going to pay 100 uh, for sure. Perhaps it could be more than 100. Perhaps you could make some money out of this. And that is actually going to come back to this question of, of sought versus sold. If all four of these coverages were sought from you, then you could potentially put a positive margin on all four. But there's also a way that we could look at it and come up with no net risk margin as a possible and realistic solution. Uh, secondly, as actuaries, I'm sure you, you probably all added some statistics at the bottom. So here I've added in the expected value, the CV and the skewness of the 
cash flows. And let's focus on the first two there, X1 and X2. Uh, we see that those two have a sort of moderate to high uh, coefficient of variation, 20%, 150%. Uh, looking at X2, you see it's got four outcomes where it takes the value zero, and then it has a very large outcome, 75 and a, and a 40. It's very uh, positively skewed high CV. Um, so looking at this and considering, you know, X1 would be um, sort of an example of, of losses from a, a non-catastrophe exposed line of business, maybe something like a commercial auto, personal auto. Um, and X2 would maybe be the types of losses you would expect from a catastrophe exposed uh, line of business. Um, in particular, both of these, since we're sitting here as an insurance company, would be insurance that we would expect to be sought by the buyer. So we would expect to have people coming to us wanting to buy coverage uh, like this. Then the other two, X3 and X4, so they have a negative skewness in particular, um, which is not what you normally uh, would expect or desire from, a, from an asset. Um, and if we look at these, uh, we see that um, the sum of them has sort of perfect negative correlation with X1 and X2. Um, and then X4 is 35, except in the last scenario where it's zero. Um, so you could actually understand that as a return of collateral on an aggregate excess of loss cover, uh, 35 X of uh, 65. And X3 then works out to be um, the residual value from an equity tranche. So if you'd funded this, uh, you'd written X1 and X2, you'd bought X4 as reinsurance, you'd need some capital coming in, you see, uh, and X3 could be, would represent the return of uh, equity to the equity holders. These two covers are things that the insurance company uh, would look to sell to the buyer because having written X1 and X2, you're thinking, okay, I need to fund the assets. I need the 100 assets in total. And they would be looking to sell these two coverages to a buyer rather than having them be sought out uh, by the buyer. So I asked you to determine your target premium for each of these risks at time t equals zero. But I didn't say whether each risk would be sought or sold at that point. And clearly the point of this whole talk is there's going to be a difference between that. So what I want to do now is introduce some terminology that we'll use uh, to distinguish between those two cases. And then we're going to use the idea of the bid price and the ask price. So if you're used to dealing with your brokerage, for example, you know that when you go and ask for a quote, you actually get two, two prices. You get told a bid price and an ask price. And the reason is because there's some transaction uncertainty. They do not know if you're going to be buying or selling. And the setup is you're sitting there as a customer, there's a market on the other side, there's some commodity product sitting in the middle, and there's an uncertainty when you ask for a quote from the market as to whether you want to buy the product or you want to sell it. And so the market quotes you two prices, it quotes you a bid price at which they will buy from you and an ask price at which they will sell to you. Now, the motivation question that I want to distinguish here is similar but, but slightly different. So we've still got a customer, um, but then we've got a market with a specific product. So it's not a commodity, it's something that's, that's customized and it could be customized to that specific customer. So if you're thinking that the market's an insurance company and the customer isn't insured, this could be an insurance policy for that customer, okay? So it's customized, not a commodity product. And we know the transaction is gonna be, the customer is gonna buy the product. That is, the, that is a given here. The question is, why does the customer buy the product? Is this something where the customer seeks the product out from the market, so they want to buy insurance and they've called into the insurer, or, and in, in which case we'll call that uh, the, the quote that they get, the ask price, or is it something that for whatever reason, the market has dreamed this product up and they know it would be advantageous for them to sell it to the customer if the customer could be convinced to buy it. And in that case, we're going to call uh, the, the price they'll accept the bid price. And you can tell obviously from the way I framed that, that we would expect the ask price to be greater than uh, the bid price. So a nice example of this is uh, to think about weather derivatives. Okay, so these are often uh, expressed as contracts that will say pay a dollar if the temperature at some location on some date is above some strike price. So you know, picture here of, of uh, uh, looking south out of Central Park, 
So we could have a weather derivative that would pay a dollar if the temperature in Central Park in New York City on July the 1st, 2024 is above 35 degrees Celsius, let's say. Um, and we could look at our weather data and we could estimate the objective probability, which would then be the loss cost on this contract. And let's say that's some value P. And we could then quote a price for this contract with a margin. So we would pro quote some price pi of C, which would be greater than P. And we can think of that, if we like, as some sort of risk-adjusted probability. So that then leads you to the question, well, what is the price for C prime that pays a dollar if the temperature is below the strike price? Okay, that becomes an interesting question. Well, what we might do there is we might observe that if we could bundle and write both C and C prime, that pays a dollar for sure, and therefore has a cost and a value equal to one. And so if our pricing rule, pi, is a no arbitrage additive pricing rule, then we expect that the price of a bundle, the price of C and C prime, should equal the separate prices of C and C prime. Because if that wasn't the case, then we could do some sort of arbitrage where we would, you know, we could sell the bundle and buy one bit and we could manufacture the other for, for the difference in price. Okay, so we would always expect our pricing rule to be uh, additive in this way. But what that's telling us is that the price pi of C prime is going to be one minus whatever the price is we ask for for C. And if the price for C is greater than P, the price for C prime will therefore be less than one minus P, which is the loss cost on uh, the C prime contract. And so that suggests uh, that this model would say we should quote C prime under cost. But then you'd say, well, why is that? Because C and C prime are symmetric. We could equally well have started with C prime and said, well, we want a positive margin on that. And then we would come up with a negative margin for C. The two things appear to be symmetric. Well, this is the joy of motivation. They only appear to be symmetric. They may not be symmetric because we've got some hidden motivations that we don't see from the description of the contract's cash flows. And in particular, if C had been sought out by a customer, then if C prime can be sold by the company at any price greater than or equal to the proceeds that it got from selling uh, C, so one minus C prime, it would, would be, um, if we can sell it for any amount greater than that, then we can make an arbitrage profit because we would in total then have more than um, $1, but we only need $1 to pay both C plus C prime. Okay, so it could make sense for the insurance company to quote C prime under cost if it was being sold as part of a package where it wrote C at the same time, because it could lock in an arbitrage profit in that case. But we know uh, New York is a big complicated place. Lots of people have a lot of air conditioning needs and so forth. And, and some people would benefit from high temperatures. Some people would benefit from low temperatures. So it's actually highly likely that the contract C prime, that is the, the sort of cold weather contract, could be sought by other buyers desiring coverage. And insurance Insco would want to quote a price with a positive margin for C prime. So it doesn't want to be locked into this idea that it needs to quote a, a price with for a negative with a negative margin uh, for C prime. And how could that come about? Well, if you follow through the math of what we did, this the step where we came up with um a negative margin for C prime relied on the idea that the price of the bundle was equal to the sum of the prices of the parts. But if we want um, to have a positive margin for C and C prime, we actually have to allow uh, that the price is sub additive because the price of the bundle is definitely one. The bundle pays one for sure. It's definitely worth one, but we, we need to allow then that the prices for the two parts can add up to more than one. But how can we do that uh, and still have no arbitrage in our model. So we're going to turn to that question next. And that's going to involve using some, some finance for insurance. And one of the characteristics of, of finance for insurance is that you can't use finance 101. You need to use a little more sophisticated view of finance, and we'll see that that is indeed the case here as well. So we need to introduce some pricing rules that allow for motivation. Uh, and we've seen that requires that we have two pricing rules. We need to have an ask price, 
when the coverage is sought by the buyer, and we'll call that A of X for risk X. And we want to have a bid price when the insurance company sells X to the buyer, when it's sold. So it's going to be the same X in both cases, and we expect that the ask to be greater than or equal to the bid. Okay, but how can we do this? How can we have these two different prices and still have no arbitrage? Well, the way to think about that is to imagine that you and a customer has come to you and sought out this coverage X. So you've written that for them. And then you've realized, oh, hey, if I can sell the minus X, if I can sell that to someone else, I end up with a net portfolio with no risk at all because X minus X is equal to zero. Obviously here we're ignoring um, credit risk in this. You know, so this is just a, a hypothetical uh, model to begin with. But we've got this net risk with uh, zero outcome in every state of the world. Therefore, it must have zero value. But what are the proceeds that we will have got from this transaction? Well, we had X was sought from us, so we would have got our ask price for X, but we turned around and we sold minus X, so we would get our bid price for minus X. And so in order for there to be no arbitrage here, we require that the ask on X plus the bid on minus X should equal zero. And that gives us these two relationships, which are a little bit of a head squeeze when you, you first see them, that uh, relationship between the ask and the bid is that the ask on X is minus the bid on minus X, and the bid on X is minus the ask on minus X. And these are going to be very helpful. We'll see these uh, over and over again. Now notice that if both X and minus X are sought from us, so we sold them both on the ask, which is going to be generally with a positive margin, well, there's going to be some profit in that. But the way we're going to understand this is that that's going to be a risky profit, not a no arbitrage profit. Because if we require that we can only write one contract at each instance in time, we are not guaranteed to be able to sell the hedge one. Let's say we write X first. We're not guaranteed to be able to write minus X. Something might happen between the time we wrote X and the time we wrote minus X. It's, um, it's only if we're able to, to write them together where we're thinking one week, one we came in and we actively match it up with another one that we sell that we have an arbitrage. If it just happens that they balance out, that's risky because it might equally well happen that they don't balance out. Okay, how can we therefore come up with a rule that gives us this different bid and ask pricing? Well, in finance, efficient market pricing rules usually what's called usually use what is called a state price density, and uh, a, a, the economist state space um, reflects all possible future states of the world. So we've got this wonderful state on the right here. This is Manhattan when we've got flying taxis and what have you. Um, it specifies everything, and um, the way finance works is it says let's consider for each state of the world what is the dot the value in that state of one dot and um, that gets us a thing called a state price density which we call z um, so z is positive the, the dollar never has a negative value uh, the average is is equal to one across all states here i'm assuming risk-free rates are zero and then to price a cash flow x we simply take the sum product over all states of the world of the number of dollars from x so that would be sort of our x of omega times Z of omega, which is the value of $1, we average that out, and that is the price of the uh, the contract X. So we would have a pricing rule which says the price of X is we just take the expected value of X times Z, where Z is our state price density. Now for us, um, this has a giant problem uh, because this P is linear in X, and it has therefore no bid ask spread. So I didn't specify whether this P was a bid or an ask, but it doesn't matter because if you go back to our relationships, ask in X is minus the bid in minus X. So let's compute what is minus P of minus X. Well, it's minus E of minus X times Z, but I can obviously move that minus outside the expectation. It cancels out and I just get P of X. Okay. So this pricing rule doesn't work for us because it has no bid ask spread. And that's exactly what we're trying to come up with. So the question is, how could it be altered and adjusted in order to include a spread? Well, it turns out that we've got the, these wonderful spectral uh, pricing rules or risk measures uh, that do this. And the trick is, rather than a fixed Z, we use X to define a custom Z, which I'll call Z sub X, 
that is is sort of you know if x is my whole world what z would i want okay and <clears throat> normal way uh, of defining the the risk rule the pricing rule is to define row of x to be the worst risk adjusted outcome over many z's so i have some collection uh, curly z here of of state price densities i compute my expected value with respect to all of those and i take the worst one of those and i say okay that's going to be my price for for x and um so subject to some technical requirements i can find a z sub x so that the price is equal to e of x times zx so it looks very much like uh the example that we had before except the zx varies with x okay and it's called uh, that zx is called a, a contact function so it's a state price density measuring how much we care about size of loss if our whole world is is x that's everything we're writing and it's a fact thing called the hardy littlewood uh, result theorem that the uh, ex maximum expectation must happen when x and z sub x are co-monotonic meaning that they increase together okay so they're going to sort of define the same ordering of events in your state space. Now the set Z here uh, that uh, we use in this maximum um, can be defined using a distortion function. And this gives us our connection with spectral uh, pricing rules. Uh, a distortion function is uh, something you may have heard of the Wang transform or the proportional hazard. It's an increasing concave function from zero one uh, to zero one that maps zero to zero and one to one. And this, I don't wanna get into the technical details, uh, it's covered in uh, page 261 of the book if you if you want to take a look at that. Spectral pricing rules now have a positive bit out spread. This is their kind of USP, if you will. And the reason is, is that if our collection of test state price densities, curly Z, is big enough, then I can find one where uh, Z weights the bad large X outcomes more than it does the small X outcomes, and therefore it's going to increase uh, the mean of x okay and for that reason we'll interpret this row of x that i've defined as the ask price because it's got a positive margin now we then get a beautiful little result that the bid price is so the bid we know bid of x is always minus the ask on minus x and if you follow that through draw yourself a little picture it's pretty easy to see that that is going to be the minimum risk adjusted value of e of x z across all z in our curly z set of test spaces so we're going to have the ask is going to be kind of the worst outcome the bid is going to be uh, the best outcome and so overall we get this very nice result uh, we're going to see that the um the bid is going to be less than the expected value for the same reasons symmetrically that the ask is greater than the expected value and therefore the spread the difference between the ask and the bid is going to be positive so we've got the spread that we wanted in the model here now, at this point, uh, we haven't talked about, we've been talking about pricing kind of everything, right? X is going to be everything that your, your company writes. Um, we always want to then be able to allocate that down uh, to individual risks. And this is where we get this wonderful uh, result idea of the uh, natural uh, premium allocation. So if um, we've gotten a, a pricing rule as the worst risk adjusted expected value, um, we know we can pick a state price density T, uh, Z sub X customized to X so that the price is just that risk adjusted expected value. If X is then a sum of different units, X1 to Xn, then it is natural to allocate to Xi just the risk adjusted expected value of Xi using the Z that goes back to your total losses. So E of Xi times z of x that should be the allocation to, to unit i now notice here i'm not allocating capital because we should all stop doing that it doesn't get you anywhere we're allocating the premium which is what you actually care about uh, directly uh, the reason i say that about capital is once you've allocated capital you still don't know what the premium is because you need to find some cost of capital to apply to it and that's actually where most of the bad things uh, that happen with that method happen uh, in that step <clears throat> Now, there's a few technical details here. We need to be careful in particular that the Z sub X is unique. Um, in general, the Z sub X is, is if, if our curly Z is given by a distortion function G, then the Z sub X is just G, G prime, the, the slope of G applied to the survival function of X. And again, that's uh, on page 261 of the book. 
And I should say also that this is really the same approach as Cotiva. Um, we're just doing it with different distortions, right? That, that works with the TVAR distortion. Here we're, we're opening up the possibility of using a number of other distortion functions. Okay, so what can we say about this natural allocation? Well, quite nicely, we can say that it lies between the standalone bid and ask prices for the component XI of the total. And we can even see when uh, each of those occurs. If xi is co-monotonic with x, if it increases with x, then the z sub x will be also a contact function for xi. And so the uh, expected value of xi times z sub x will equal rho of x, which is the ask price. And that will then also equal the natural allocation. And if it's anti-co-monotonic, um, then it will equal the bid for symmetric reasons. So broadly speaking, you can see that what's going on here is when you've got a, a positive margin, you're going to be dealing with components that are more likely to be sought. And when you have a negative margin, you're going to be dealing with uh, components that are more likely to be sold to the customer. So now let's look at what we should quote for these uh, various risks. And I want to start by looking at our ask price for the insurance cash flow. So we're an insurance company. We're envisaging that these risks are going to come into us and we need to come up with our ask price for them. And we're going to implement the algorithm described in the book uh, for computing the linear natural allocation to uh, X1 and X2 as part of X, the sum of X1 and X2. The first step of doing that is to collapse the outcomes by value of X. So we've done this here in this little table on the right. There are four outcomes that give a total of 40, and we average the corresponding values of x1 and x2, and the averages work out to be 34 and 6. The probability of that scenario is then 40%. The remaining scenarios have probability of 10%. And then we compute the survival function, the probability that the outcome is strictly greater than uh, the values given by x here, 90, 80, so, and so forth, down to 0. There's a 0% 0 chance of an outcome strictly greater than 100. Now we need to select some sort of a distortion function to use to make our curly Z set of test uh, contact functions. I'm going to use one called the dual distortion. This is a slightly more moderate, less uh, tail centric uh, distortion than the proportional hazard um, or uh, in particular proportional hazard and Wang transform. The formula is one minus one minus S to a power. And I've calibrated this power here to give us a 15% return on uh, capital with assets of 100, okay? Now we need assets of 100 because one of the outcomes gives us losses of 100 and we're assuming no default. So what we do uh, to compute our risk-adjusted probabilities is we apply G to our survival function to get G of S and then we take the differences of, of G of S. So we get uh, the first scenario gets its probability knocked down to 2.5%, 5%, 7%, 42% for the big mass in the middle, 13, 14, and 15 and a half percent for the worst outcome. The Z function that we're looking at is given by the ratio of Q to P. Now we can compute various objective and risk adjusted expected values. So EPs shown here are going to be the sum product of the X values with the objective probabilities P, and we, they're, give, they're going to give us the loss costs. EQs are going to be the sum product of the X values with our Q risk adjusted probabilities, and we're going to interpret those as risk loaded premiums. Um, the uh, price for X is going to be our row of X, and then the 32.3 and the 21.3 are going to give us our natural allocations of X1 and X2 part of X. Okay, We can see overall the loss ratio is 87%. Uh, the non-cat um, allocation is 98.1% uh, loss ratio, and the cat has a 70.1% loss ratio. So the details of this uh, algorithm are given in the book, and the references noted that. What about the financing cash flows? So here we're thinking we would want the bid price, because having written X1 and X2, we need to finance that. We need to go out and sell uh, X3 and X4 uh, to our counterparties. 
Um, you do that by sorting uh, your outcomes in descending order by the total. So the total financing descending here, which is the same order because it's 100 minus x1 uh, plus x2. So we don't need to do any reordering. Um, we can then do the same idea of the sum product of these quantities with the P and Q that we had on the previous slide and get objective expected values and then the price. The bid price here, you notice, is lower than the expected value. So there's a sort of we're buying a future cash flow at a discount. And we can say, uh, what is the return to the investor? Well, the investor, let's let's look at, say, X3. The return there that you get as a, at time T equals one on an expected basis is 21.9. The price they're willing to pay for that at time T equals zero is 16.85. So their return is going to be 21.9 over 16.85 minus 1, works out to be a 30% return to the equity tranche, uh, a 6.5% uh, return on the reinsurance side, and the overall return is going to be 15% across all the financing because that's how we calibrated the distortion. Okay, So equity comes up with a higher return because it's dealing with the volatility. The ag stop is, is basically a tail risk, has somewhat cheaper capital because it's a little more debt-like it's uh, more uh, removed from loss. I should mention here that the financing we're talking about is the financing of the insurance company. This is not asset risk. We have no asset risk on the table at all here at the moment. That's, a, nah, that's another talk. Okay, so I snatched that distortion out of thin air. 15%, everyone wants 15% return. That's a, that's a fine number, but uh, what about the, the dual distortion? How did I come up with that? So these distortion functions, I should just may say, you know, they, they look like this uh, line here on the left. They're increasing. Concave means that they're, they're bowed down like this. Um, and you can think of them as giving the price of the ask price for a risk with a probability S of having a loss. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to have a margin in, so it's going to lie above the diagonal, the diagonal then that gives you your, your loss cost. Um, you, your premium is going to include your margin. And then um, in order to write a Bernoulli zero one risk, you need capital of one and uh, assets of one rather. So you're going to have capital one minus the premium. So you, you can compute sort of all the bits you want from this G. There's a nice dictionary between distortions and more uh, commonly used uh, insurance uh, terms. All right. So I looked at the dual distortion here. There's a nice range of, uh, there's, there's a ton of distortions. If you look in the book, we've probably got 20 or 30 that we look at, but there's five in particular that I always look at because they give a nice bracketing of, of sort of different common risk uh, tolerances and risk appetites. The CCLC is the constant cost of capital um, distortion. That basically says all capital costs 15%. I don't care where it is. Um, then you've got your proportional hazard transform, uh, your Wang transform, your dual transform that we just used and your TVAR uh, transform. And these get progressively cheaper at providing tail capital, but correspondingly more expensive on volatility capital. So they're reflecting different views of the relative price of volatility risk, sort of earnings misses, if you will, versus tail risk. So we can, they're all, they all rely on one parameter. The, the details are shown in the book. Uh, so we can back into what that parameter is to hit our 15% return on assets of 100. And uh, then we can uh, do the analysis that we did before. We can compute the loss ratios and returns on investments across these different um, distortions. So in total, they all return 15% because that's how we calibrated them. Uh, and they are correspondingly going to have the same total margin in. So they're all going to produce an 87% loss ratio across the two uh, units there, the cat and non-cat. But the results are going to vary by distortion in, in quite interesting ways. So the, what we just looked at was the dual. There we saw 98.1% price loss ratio for X1 and a 70.1% loss ratio for X2. The constant cost of capital here at the top, much more concerned about tail risk. So it wants a much higher price, lower loss ratio for X2, but it'll put up with a much lower price. And in fact, a, a loss ratio for X1 over 100, right? So it's, it's willing to accept a negative margin on X1 um, and make it up by really dinging the, the cat line there, totaling out to 87. And you can see the, the ordering I described on these uh, five distortions, is, it follows uh, most tail-centric, so then cat 
gets progressively a lower premium, higher loss ratio as we move down the column here. Um, on the financing side, uh, we start off, uh, the constant cost of capital says, don't care about the former capital, it all costs 15%. So the equity and the reinsurance both cost 15%. But then as we go down the column, we see that the reinsurance becomes relative, relatively less valuable. So for dual, the cost of that capital only 6.5%, much less than equity. But again, because we have to balance overall to a 15% return, um, the equity gets more expensive. So this is exactly when management talks about charging for volatility risk. This is exactly the kind of, kind of thing they've got in mind. In fact, we see, and it is a coincidence here, but it almost steps up in 5% increments, right? 15% return to equity, 21, 25, 30, 35%, reflecting the greater cost of uh, volatility uh, implicit in the different distortions that we've got here. Uh, from a picture perspective, these are the, the what these, these things look like. This blue line here is our constant cost of capital distortion, jumps up at zero, and then it's a straight line. Uh, the TVAR distortion goes down to zero, and, and you can see here, we're sort of, the margin can't get any more than charging a dollar for a dollar's limit, so it's sort of maxed out here in the tail, maximum cost in the tail, minimum cost for extreme uh, losses. Uh, this is the survival function, so big losses are on the left here. And then on the right-hand side plot, we've got the uh, proportional hazard, which you can see comes in, in most steeply. Then the wang is the orange dots, and then the green is the dual. So the dual is, it's not nearly as extreme as the TVAR, but it has the, the cheapest tail capital um, of any of these um, outside the TVAR. Um, and that's why it represents a, a fairly balanced uh, view of risk. So I want to give you a couple of applications and then discuss implementation of this. So the first application is uh, to diversifying cat risk. So a diversifying cat has got nothing to do with a feline. It is a catastrophe risk from a non-peak peril. So something like a Chile earthquake or Australia or New Zealand, if not Florida, you know, uh, New York area, California quake, something which uh, it's, uh, it's not going to be the biggest possible loss you have. And it's a common question amongst people doing capital modeling is like, okay, well, what, what is the appropriate price for that? So the margin that we see that's coming out of this model for diversifying cat balances two effects. Essentially what a diversifying cat does for you is it causes volatility, but not extreme tail volatility. So it's got an insurance component where there's risk in the body and that you would think to sell that for the ask price and you would want a positive margin for it. But it also has a financing benefit in the tail and the model reflects that, okay, financing benefit, I accept the bid price, I don't need the ask, and that has a negative margin. In it. So what the natural allocation does when it prices um, a diversifying cat risk like this within a portfolio is there's some offset to the insurance risk from the financing benefit. And the next, the net price you get is going to depend on the relative weighting of the body and the volatility or tail capital. So uh, if you're if you really value tail capital a lot, your financing benefit will be much greater and that will lower the margin that you see. And it's possible to do this uh, decomposition uh, explicitly. So you might um, not want to do this. You might want to say, well, I don't want my underwriters getting credit for the financing benefit. So I just want to charge them for the insurance risk potentially. Um, and there's certainly uh, some nice ways that you can do that. Um, but this is so it, it isn't a matter of the model is, is the model doesn't really have an opinion. This is what the model is doing. And this may or may not agree with how you think things uh, should be should be priced. Um, I would also mention here that the a default, which somewhat thoughtless default that people tend to use, is they use the constant cost of capital um, distortion. Um, you you can get you can suck get suckered into doing that without actually knowing that you're doing it, but mathematically you are doing it. That is very very tail centric, and that gives you the biggest financing benefit. And that's why, as we saw in the previous exhibit, that X1 got written over 100% because it gets a big financing benefit 
and the tail capital for cat is getting charged at a very expensive rate. Um, the second application is to reinsurance decision making. Uh, and there we saw um, a range of implied costs for reinsurance from 15% down to 65 for the dual, I think 4.3 uh, for the TVAR. And what you find if you, you use this with sort of realistically calibrated examples is that that range of distortions from constant cost of capital uh, to TVAR actually sort of crosses market pricing for, for cap risk. Okay, so the range of outcomes that you get across the different distortions brackets typical market cap pricing. And so your risk appetite is, is very material to your reinsurance decision making. Now, I'm not here to tell you what the right or wrong answer is. It's up to you to determine where your risk capital lies and which model best represents that. But it be forewarned that it can absolutely have a, uh, an impact on your uh, reinsurance decision making. And this presentation I gave earlier this year at uh, Lloyd's about this with an explicit example of that uh, calibrated using uh, cap on pricing, if you care to look that. Uh, finally, for implementation, as I mentioned, all of the slides here uh, can be implemented using my aggregate software. I've created a Colab uh, notebook. Um, if you click on this or scan the QR code, it'll take you to that. You can execute it. I think it even works on a phone. You don't need to install anything. You can just step through and you can see all of the exhibits and graphs that I, I used here. Some of them are cherry picked out of the, the results, but that will show you the logic uh, in order to, to run this. And if you want to uh, get started on, on uh, aggregate, um, it's an open source free software. You can download it off GitHub. GitHub. You can install it using PyPy. Uh, you can use it using R with the reticulate package. Um, and uh, it's a very nice uh, interactive way of uh, playing around with aggregate distributions and applying a lot of these spectral pricing methods. And so I'll just end with my uh, contact information. I'll put this also at, at the bottom of the presentation. Thank you.